My husband and I had just relocated from Ohio to Vermont for my new job, and we'd been here only about a couple of months before my mother-in-law came to visit from Thailand. She had come at the perfect time of year. The leaves were turning the most amazing colors on the trees, so we took Ma to a popular outdoor destination. But in order for us to tour the property, we needed to purchase passes at the gift shop. I walk into the shop and it doesn't escape my notice that I'm the only person of color there. But that's not so unusual. After all, Vermont's racial makeup is about 95% white. So the clerk served all the customers in line ahead of me, but when I stepped up to the counter, she closed the till, walked to the opposite end of the shop, and started folding a pile of t-shirts as if I didn't even exist. Now, hold that thought. And let's fast forward to earlier this year. My husband and I went to our favorite movie theater in New Hampshire, and a very similar incident occurred. The white man at the counter served all the white customers, but when my husband and I walked up to buy our tickets, he stepped back and simply ignored us. His coworker over at the snack station even asked him, don't you see you have customers right in front of you? He shrugged it off and just stood there, as if eventually we'd just disappear. So she stepped over and sold us the tickets. Now, I know what some people may be thinking because a few brave souls have actually said it out loud from time to time. You're not even that black. And I have a couple of responses to that. The first one is this. Black comes in many shades. And I've worked hard to succeed in systems that were originally designed to hold back my family, my friends, and me. The second response, and this is the most important one, it's this. Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity, period. As I started talking to other people of color in rural New England towns, I was hearing a lot of the same hidden stories of indignity that I had heard or experienced locally and when I'd lived in urban settings throughout the United States. So it's easy for me to empathize with black people across the spectrum who are making their voices heard. Now, this semester, when I was asked to develop a design thinking project, these thoughts were weighing heavily on, on my mind and on my heart, and I wanted to do something grounded in scholarship and with a real world application, something that was connected to the movement for black lives. I selected the five-stage design process used by the Stanford D School and the Interaction Design Foundation because it's such a well-studied and well-accepted model. It should come as no surprise that the model starts with empathy. It's been shown time and time again and in multiple contexts that innovation is inextricably linked to empathy. Tim Brown, the uh, CEO of the innovation and design firm IDEO, once wrote that the three mutually reinforcing elements of any successful design program are insight, observation, and, you guessed it, empathy. So before I explain what I did for my design thinking project, it's important to know at least a little of my background. Racial healing is an integral part of both my research and practice. I'm a doctoral student at the Union Institute and University, majoring in ethical and creative leadership and working toward a specialization in Martin Luther King studies and social change. I'm also a non-traditional student, which means I work a lot <laughs> while I'm in school. Presently, I serve as the communications minister for the Episcopal Diocese of Vermont and I co-facilitate their racial reconciliation team. Additionally, I own a small creative agency that serves a handful of nonprofits and women and minority-owned businesses. And behind the scenes, I'm also a musician. My career actually started in the recording industry, and as part of my full-time job, I used to produce remixes for various labels, major and independent, and write music for film and television. And I still do quite a bit of recording and producing today. 
From an academic perspective, I'm interested in exploring how pop music can be a leadership tool specifically for leading social change. When we talk about the act of leadership, empathy, again, is a recurring theme. For example, it's one of the five components of emotional intelligence, which research has shown weighs even more heavily than IQ and technical skills on a leader's effectiveness. And in the context of social movements, solidarity, defined as love and empathy, is what moves people to act. So empathy, more than anything, was the impetus behind this design thinking project. The next challenge a design thinker faces is defining a problem. The goal of the define mode of design thinking is to craft a meaningful and actionable problem statement. I was sifting through several key insights at this point. For a start, I had observed at rallies and marches in support of Black Lives that the majority of the songs and chants were being adopted from earlier movements, in particular, the labor movement and the civil rights movement. Now, these songs were working well because they're traditional songs. Most people are already familiar with them. And they can be easily learned during a march or at a rally. So traditional songs, primarily made popular in the 50s and 60s, had essentially become the status quo of protest music. On a wider scale, I was also gathering insights from various other sources. For example, in January, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology published a video called uh, Building a Toolbox for Nonviolent Resistance in which Jamila Rakib explains how technology enables activists to recruit thousands of individuals to public protests relatively quickly. But, as Rakib says, Just because you've managed to get people in the streets to demand change doesn't mean necessarily they understand the objectives of the movement. And I was finding this to be very true as I casually asked participants and spectators alike what the movement of Black Lives, uh, movement for Black Lives was all about, I was hearing a variety of answers, usually related to a specific injustice that had precipitated the march or rally on that day. I was finding that the only people who ever mentioned the movement for Black Lives platform by name were people who worked in social justice fields. This has tremendous leadership implications. When Simon Sinek, talks about his model for inspirational leadership, the Golden Circle. He gives historic examples of organizations and people that have led revolutionary changes from Apple computers to the Wright brothers to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And what has separated these iconic leaders from their counterparts throughout history is how well they communicated their purpose, their cause, or their beliefs. Sinek says that People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So when we talk in terms of nonviolent resistance, people don't buy the protest or the rally, which is a response to a precipitating event. They buy why we do that protest or rally, which is a shared vision for dignity and humanity. And the Movement for Black Lives platform does a really great job of communicating this shared vision for more than 50 organizations nationally, and the many individuals that support the platform. So it occurred to me that maybe what we have here is an unarticulated need that music is uniquely equipped to fill. Why not compose a song that communicates the Movement for Black Lives platform? Simple, right? Now here's one area where traditional design differs greatly from design thinking. In traditional design, I would go off and write a song at this point. It may even be a good song. <laughs> By contrast, though, design thinking assumes that the problem may be more complex, more nuanced than it appears on the surface. Additionally, design thinking suggests that we can expand our insights beyond a single story by involving an interdisciplinary team. In this case, I was curious what I might learn and what of my own assumptions I might change if I spend some time talking with racial justice activists across a broad range of professional, social, and academic backgrounds, these activists would, in essence, be like that interdisciplinary design team. What we would share in common, the movement for black lives, would be our point of empathy. But beyond that, 
would be limitless space for divergent insights. This is how I would avoid the myopia of writing the song from a sing single point of view. It just so happens that Brattleboro, Vermont is home to the Root Social Justice Center. And that's where I met Sheila Linton and the Root Collective, a team that focuses on people of color-led racial justice organizing. And when I pitched my idea about writing a song to communicate the Movement for Black Lives platform, the Root Collective was remarkable. They assembled this highly diverse focus group of activists all connected to the Movement for Black Lives, and they gave me one evening just to sit and talk with them. Design thinking is portrayed as five neatly packaged stages, but it's really a non-linear process. Those loops and leaps are shown in the interaction design illustration. To that end, by the time I sat down with, the, with this focus group, I was already knee deep in the ideation process. I had two sets of lyrics, five possible melodies, none of which I liked, and I was torn between two or three different genres of music. And now I was adding another layer to, of complexity to that by involving a team. Design researcher Nigel Cross studied similar phenomena in product designers, where three aspects of the design process tend to overlap. He, he categorized those as clarifying the task, searching for concepts, and, and fixing the concept. When I considered Cross's findings in light of my own experience, and I compared this to the five-stage design thinking process, what I realized was an interplay between the define and ideate stages that I think is really understated in the academic literature about design thinking. It could be argued that define and ideate really go hand in hand. In any case, I knew I would only have one evening with this team, so as I was drafting my discussion points, I structured the conversation to achieve three things. First of all, I needed to take a step back to the de defined stage and sort out whether the participants even agreed that there was a communication gap with the Movement for Black Lives platform that music could possibly help fill, or was this assumption based entirely on my own bias? Second of all, if they agreed with the definition of the problem as I saw it, I wanted any ideas that they could offer me in terms of genre and stylistic devices that might resonate with an audience of current and potential supporters. And third, although I didn't have a full-fledged composition at that point, I did have an early draft of, of lyrics. Actually, it was just a concept. But if the first two-thirds of our meeting were successful, I was hoping the team might play around with those lyrics and, and share their impressions. This would tell me whether my nascent idea was even worth developing with additional insights, of course, or whether I should just scrap it and start over. The focus group was really supportive of the early draft, mostly. There were two points raised that, that I actually didn't expect. One was the constant reference to standing. So in the original lyrics, reparations, what we stand for, investments, what we stand for, one member of the focus group was sensitive to inclusive language. The concern was that the lyrics might alienate those who were physically unable to stand. So what that told me was that at some point I would want to test this song with people with disabilities if, of course, I kept those lyrics, which I later did. And this note about inclusivity also influenced my decision to make the subtitles an interactive part of the music video, not just a closed caption that could be toggled on and off. Another comment, and this was a big one, was about the hook of the song. You see, A Vision for Our Lives, the line that eventually became the title of the song, was never even in the original draft. It was an aha moment inspired by a comment that was made in that focus group discussion. So by the time I left, I not only had a very clearly stated problem, I also had a sense of the genre and the style and the tone that I was aiming for. At this point, I had to go back to the studio and create something. And there was a lot of back and forth between ideate and prototype. In the recording world, your prototype is called a demo. So it's a rough recording of the song. And with every demo of the song that I produced, I had new ideas about the song that I wanted to demo. So the good news is, thanks to my work with the focus group, I had a clear creative brief from which to work. And that gave me some parameters in terms of the genre, the style, even the tempo. As the lead designer, for lack of a better term, 
I got to decide how far I could stretch those parameters of the creative brief. Here's the thing though, in order to truly benefit from the five stage design thinking process in a perfect world, I would have been presenting those prototypes back to my design team. In this case, the original focus group. But this was a problem. We don't live in a perfect world, and I knew going into the project that the same individuals who participated in that original focus group might not be available to me again prior to my November 20th deadline. But that turned out to be more of an opportunity than a problem. Let me explain. Dr. Shekhar Mitra, a design thinker and, and president of the innovation firm Innopreneur, talks about the difference between clients and end users, and both need to be engaged in the design thinking process. For example, when a pharmaceutical company is developing a new drug, not only does that drug have to meet the needs and expectations of the patient, who's the end user of the product, but it also has to meet the requirements of the Food and Drug Administration, which serves as a client in the process. Similarly, my focus group, made up of activists, was essentially my client. They had given me their requirements for the song, so in this prototyping phase, where I decided to go was to demonstrate my work for potential end users, starting with my most trusted critic, my husband. Hey, Steve. No, no, that's fine. I was just, uh, just working on the song. So, what do you think of the demo? Okay. Okay. Oh my God. Hey, Jennifer. So what did you think of the track? You have some notes. Okay, I'm all ears. This is good. Finally, with a decent demo in hand, I headed off to New York City to lay down the lead vocals. And everything from here was just a blur. But during and after this time, the demo process never actually stopped. I kept dripping out versions of the track intentionally and just listening, listening to the comments and adding them to the insights that I'd been collecting and documenting throughout the process. In fact, and this is a fundamental difference between design thinking and traditional design. In traditional design, the designer stops when the product is built, but the design thinker is holistic they tend to press ahead. So at some point during the prototyping of the song, I realized that all of the insights that I had gathered along the way had told me not only how the song should sound, but perhaps even how it should look. Now believe me, I could do a separate documentary just on the making of the video, but the point here is that the cycle of ideation and prototyping had a snowball effect. Now it's just two days to deadline. It's time to officially close out the prototype and move on to the final test. But since the beginning of this project, a couple of issues have been just gnawing at my brain, and I think they're worth addressing. Here's the first issue. Conventional wisdom has it that design thinking must be a formalized, team-based activity. The problem with this thinking is that in real-life practice, formalized teams are sometimes not feasible. However, there are plenty of case studies beyond my own that support the idea of stakeholder engagement involving both the customer and the client substantively in the design process and creating interdisciplinarity by seeking insights from disciplines other than your own. My second issue is the notion that design thinking is reserved for solving radical problems in science and technology, like fixing climate change, redesigning government, or perfecting artificial intelligence. But again, both my experience and other case studies have shown that problems of all magnitudes and in a variety of contexts can be worthy prospects for design thinking. Speaking both as an artist and as a leadership scholar, I find that design thinking makes me more effective at defining real unarticulated problems. It makes me holistic in my approach to solutions and intentional about the results, all without sacrificing creativity. This was a lot of work for one little song. 
So how'd I do? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that.
I hold my hands up, hold my demons up as the vision for my life. We kneel, we stand up, we stand up. Reparations, what we stand for. Reparations, what we stand for. Investments, what we stand for. Investments, what we stand for. Powers, what we stand for. Powers, what we stand for. Black lives. Black lives. Black lives. Black lives. Communities, what we stand for. Communities, what we stand for. Economies, what we stand for. Economies, what we stand for. Now it's time to end this war. Now it's time to end this war. On black lives. On black lives. Black lives. Black lives. Black lives.